What do we usually say? Welcome to the show. This is a couple of musicians. Welcome to the show. Today, we're very excited to be talking with bassoonist Monica Ellis. She is the bassoonist in the Imani Wind Quintet, one of the most important woodwind quintets working today. And as a woodwind player, I have to say, it's kind of a dream come true to be able to travel the world with your chamber ensemble, which Imani Winds has successfully been able to do for the last, I don't even know how many years, 25 years. So we're going to find out more about Life on the Road with Imani Winds and Monica Ellis. All right. Hi, Keith. Hi, Monica. <laughs> Hi, Carrie. <laughs> Good to see you. Good to see you guys. Thanks for having me. It's so fun to connect you. with people, with friends that, you know, just haven't seen throughout everything. I know. You know, I'm all, I've been on every panel in the, under the sun, and I don't really care what I say, but my background is what I'm usually upset about. <laughs> yeah, look good. Yeah. You don't have the wall of books that everybody has these days. No. Look, look, like that right there. That. And we have a million questions for you, but um, we were just talking about COVID, and uh, I'm wondering if the quintet is in each other's circle. Like, can you have live rehearsals and everything? No, us Imani Winds have not been together as a group since the end of February. Our wow. last engagement was February 24th. And uh, at that time, in, a, in less than three weeks later, two weeks after that would have been the next engagement. So we would have seen one another, you know, right away. Again, it was high season. Um, but uh, we no, we've not had any inter interaction. You know, there's different levels of comfort, different levels of, of desire to, to come together. Even here in New York, we've got the lowest numbers possible. But you know, it's um, it's still just those those small chances of of something happening. And so, just to be 100%. I mean, nothing's 100%, right? That, therein lies the point. But um, to try to get to that level it's really hard it's been hard for us to think about coming together to play wind instruments we're so. doing a, a fair amount of work preparing and kind of collecting figuring out how to do a fair amount of online activities um with organizations that realize this is possible this can this can be something that they can give to their communities and so that just takes its own level of um planning uh, so I have to say, w because you can see somebody, I mean, this is rather remarkable that we do have this type of technology and that it's so robust, you know, because we do have it, it, it feels like we're not so disconnected. I so guess. over the last, like, I don't know, five or 10 years or whatever, what was the average number of days that you were on the road with the quintet? Um, it, well, I mean, even from 10 years ago, it was almost, almost 300 days, you know, it was the, the vast majority. Then since then though, and so even from 10 to five years, there's been a pretty distinct difference because we realized it was just, you know, way too much. It was quite, it was rather unsustainable to kind of, you know, keep that type of, of level. Um, so now, you know, it's, it's in the, it's in like the 150, 170, I think. And I'm counting everything, you know, I'm counting not just the, not, not that we've got 170 recitals, but all of the residencies, all of the, you know, the week long things here and there where we do a master class and we do a, um, you know, series of concerts for outreach type things. I'm even talking about our 11 day festival, our chamber music festival in the summer. So, um, so it, it is, it, it's a comprehensive answer yeah. <laughs> and, and that, you know, that could apply to right here in the city. Um, but it's still, you know, the work for just the group is still for, for sure the, the lion's share of my activities and and my brain my uh you know brain capacity is mostly filled up <laughs> with things that have to do with imani wins um, did you guys always have it in mind that you would be a group that would do really different repertoire um you know create your own repertoire because valerie and jeff are composers like was that always from the very beginning that that was a goal of imani wins it was it really was jeff himself from day one said if if you guys you know, you girls are cute and all, but listen, if you're gonna, uh, <laughs> he never said, I always add that because I think it's kind of fun. If you're gonna be a, in a wind quintet, it's like you'll get through four concerts of different music and that's it. <laughs> that's right. The repertoire right. just isn't there. So, you know, you have to be thinking about uh, commissions and composers writing for you and just collaborations. You know, you gotta, yeah, that's gotta be where your head's at. Otherwise,
I was always the person that was kind of the, the, the leader of sorts when it comes to administrative duties, financial duties, the liaison with um, the group and the, and the, uh, our management, our agent. So I was always that person, you know, anyway, from the very beginning, really from three years in, I took that role on and, and like it, I'm, I'm, I, I say I'm kind of like UPS. I love logistics. It's been a role that I've had and, and enjoyed for, for many, many years. Um, now, what's interesting is that uh, just in the last two years, we started our own foundation, our, a, a nonprofit aspect, and we had not had that before. Um, and so that has changed. The, the role within the group because of that has, has changed because you know, now we're talking about grants and, and Toyin really has always been the development person. She's been the one that has led the charge um, with writing grant applications, getting grants, staying, you know, creating a donor list, um, having a board, bylaws. Um, it ain't easy. This is the stuff they do not teach us at the conservatory. Yeah, even in like the best of worlds with the business of music classes, there's still stuff that you're not gonna, you know, not gonna learn until you're just out there in it, you know. No, so it's just interesting all the different ways that you can form a group and run a group and, and all the different aspects that you don't think about when you're like, oh, I really like these people. Let's form a quintet. And then, you know, if you are successful, that leads to all these other things. You know, it's just interesting. It's very interesting. Um, you hope that you'll find people that will click, that you'll stick together with. And, you know, that happened for us. For 17 years, we were the same personnel. And then uh, when Miriam left, um, to do amazing other things, I, you know, that was a long time. So it was cool. <laughs> um, Mark came on board and, and lightning really kind of struck again because he's such an amazing musician and, and person. And, and so you kind of just hope that that connection will be there and that that will be, and the same thing has happened with Brandon really too, when Valerie left, um, three years, two years ago, three years ago. Um, so you really hope that it'll be there and it, 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 you build on that, you know, you do, you do kind of create your content and your mission behind who's in the group. At the same time, when there is change of personnel, to have a solid foundation is really important too. Right. Because, yeah. you know, it, there, people's lives are going to shift. Things are going to happen. Um, so you, you still want to have, you know, so I, we often talk to groups and say, listen, think about what you want as an individual, but what the group means and what, you know, we call it the six member. We literally have six members and the group is that is that six member. So yeah. well, one of the things that we like to talk about in this series is mentors and, and people who really made a difference in your career or maybe the life of the quintet. Is there somebody like that in, in your history? My actual teachers on my instrument all have just been super influential for me. And you know, I can start from the most recent, which was Frank Morelli at Juilliard and, and Manhattan School of Music. Um, and so, yeah, like how I play, literally how I approach the instrument is directly related to Frank and how he plays and, and, and you know, his, his instruction from Steve Maxim and, and you know, um, a generation before him. And then at Oberlin, my teacher, George Sakakini, also just a very, you know, just full of personality, so technique driven. And uh, then back in high school, my teacher in high school at, in Pittsburgh, where I grew up, uh, Mark Panserev. And uh, he was the second player in the symphony. And I would go to his house for these like epic two hour lessons uh, in high school. And he, he, was, he would tell me things that I had no idea what he was talking about half the time, but he would talk to me like that. Like he would even preface it by saying, you may not know this, but you will learn it. He would just say stuff. And he's like, oh, this reminds me of, of a Dvorak symphony. You know, at the time I was like, who's Dvorak? But you know, <laughs> I said that in my head. And, but I remember that to this day. So my middle school band teacher who actually introduced this instrument to me. So Art Powell, Arthur Powell in, in, uh, in, in, in my public school, middle school. I think that, you know, having those teachers as mentors at that young age in the public school in music is just yeah. huge for us. Huge. Uh, I also want to say, you know, I've seen you guys in master class like at the um, Mostly Modern Festival when the quintet came and played and all those college students are just so eager and hungry to learn from you guys and to talk to you and to learn about your life on the road. I'll never forget Mark watching a clarinetist play a piece that was incredibly hard that he didn't know. 
and he stood there afterwards and he said, you know, it's funny that I'm supposed to say something now because you sound amazing and I don't know this piece and I have no idea what kind of wisdom I can share with you. Right. Then of course he stood there and said just pearls of wisdom, amazing stuff to the student that made a huge difference. And, but you guys are so approachable. And I think that's what makes you so likable to everybody. So master classes can be, can just be seriously downers, you know, if you're not, um, <laughs> if you're not there to, to uplift somebody and, and to talk about what it is that they are doing well and hopefully make that difference. We want to hear some juicy tales of concerts in Brazil or touring Europe or anything that you that you are missing right now and that that you have a fond memory of oh well, I mean I'm missing the touring just terribly I I, um, I miss uh, I, my little joke has been I never knew I, how much I would miss the Delta Lounge uh, <laughs> it starts with the Delta it's all about because truly the of course you know traveling and, and again you know, y'all know this traveling is it's very brutal and it's it's not it's it's hard in the grand scheme of things, just that little two hours on stage takes you three days to, to get there. <laughs> so, um, so, you know, we treat our, we try to treat ourselves well and, and, and have kind of create an environment, create a, um, uh, an experience, you know, and that's, and that is like, yeah. So the group is going to pay for our, for our access to the lounge, you know, like that's a thing that we are, we've chosen to spend some money on because it makes us happier. We went to New Zealand, um, I guess it's now been three years ago. We had a, we had a three week tour in New Zealand and it was just literally the most beautiful thing. <laughs> we, we just kept saying enough with the picturesque, you know, rolling hills. And now it's been probably seven years ago, we had a, 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 a tour in China, massive amounts of people, but um, beautiful people, warm. They were so receptive to our music that you know, they don't have in, any real connection to, but um, they wanted to learn and, and just, you know, really, really open. Yeah, and then um, I guess I'll, you know, one other thing, which is really at the top of the list is when we were able to go on the road with Wayne Shorter and the Wayne Shorter Quartet. Wayne wrote a piece for us and, and one was at Hollywood Bowl, one was at Carnegie Hall, Disney Hall, and um, yeah, I mean, the, the whole tour started at the Montreal Jazz Festival in the year that it started. So, you know, just these crazy high profile, um, but again, very just warm and people were, were into the project and his music, you know, is timeless and, and ridiculous. Um, I mean, these these halls that you mentioned are just, you know, epic and, and uh, a dream come true for so many of us musicians that that train for this. It's true. We've been really, really lucky, you know, and at the same time, I also say there's there's some of the best concerts have been really small communities you know um just that aren't aren't the big university towns or the big hall towns um you know just a just a small little community that that like that's the big thing for their for their community um so that's been lovely too just just really really beautiful places because you know that you're just making a difference for this for this community you know yeah. but, but we did record an album last last year that we were we were hoping would come out uh kind of nowish but um it's it's been it's been pushed to to um to later in the year maybe at the beginning of the next year and so that's really exciting oh, and so the pieces are very provocative um timely uh one piece is by um Vijay Iyer jazz pianist composer uh Corey Smythe is the piano player with it and it's called Bruit or Bruit if you go the French route, B-R-U-I-T-S. Um, and he wrote it after the death of Trayvon Martin. And wow. when the stand your ground law was being, you know, so in the news, because of course that's what George Zimmerman was saying that he was, you know, he, he had the right to, to, to murder that boy. Uh, it kind of speaks for the voices of, of, mothers who have lost their children to, to this senseless violence. Uh, the second piece is by Frederick Jeffsky, um, famous composer, and some, it was written in celebration of the centennial of, um, his name is John Hope Franklin, who was an African-American scholar um, and historian. And so he actually taught at Duke University and Duke commissioned the, this piece, and it's called Sometimes, and it's um, this sort of deconstruction of sometimes I feel like a motherless child, the spiritual. So, um, so 
that is uh, <laughs> that is my six year old screaming at the television. Um, real life, baby, real talk. Yeah. Um, finally, a piece by Rena Esmael, Indian American composer. Um, she's just a brilliant, brilliant entity and just a force. Um, and she wrote this, this piece for us and it's called um, The Light is the Same. And the notion being we all look up at the stars, we might think differently, we might think of different gods in the sky, but at the same time, the, the light is still the same. And so it's really sort of a notion of, of you know, we're more alike than we're not. So um, three gorgeous works, three really, really different pieces. Um, so it's all gonna be on this, on this next record. So yeah, stay tuned, stay tuned for that. Monica, it's so great to talk with you and to just you know, hear how you're doing right now and what's going on with the group. So thank you so thank much you. for joining us. You're so welcome, thanks for having me. And kudos to you guys for doing this. I mean, just to, you know, we all have to find ways to keep ourselves occupied and, and, and you know, not, not make us just go crazier than we already are, so, yeah. you know, yeah. No, it's we usually really have parties to hear stories like this. We can't have parties, so next we'll make videos. Yep. <laughs> All right. Y'all take care. Thank Bye. you, Monica. Bye.